внимание, говорит и показывает Базитию. Внимание, внимание, говорит и показывает Базитию. Hi, welcome to Medifia's Calling. I'm Josh. I'm one of the editors and producers and writers around here. I guess a jack of all trades. And uh, I would like to introduce our new co-host, Zarina. And uh, tell us where you are. Hi, I'm at the London Comic Con, October 2015. It's a lot of fun. So what sort of things are going on there? Um, well, we've got a lot of parties and lots of guests and a lot of my friends are there and lots and lots of cosplay. I mean, I've got my um, Starfleet uniform on right now. It's Halloween at the Starfleet mess, so I've got my cat ears. Yeah, I'm ready to roll. Okay. So are you a Cation or is this just extra cat ears? Uh, this is just like my normal cat ears for everyday wear. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. So... Uh, I guess uh, the first thing we'll do is um, check out some news. News from Motifius. Well, we finished the Infinity Kickstarter, uh, which ended last Sunday at 346,000 pounds, which is over half a million dollars, which is incredible. And, um, We've become number three uh, Kickstarter for role-playing games and the number one for introducing a new role-playing game, the new newest kind of role-playing launch, which is amazing. So it just shows what a passionate community Infinity's got. And uh, already we unlocked another book afterwards uh, because we announced uh, we had enough PayPal funds to take us over the £350,000 goal which unlock the technology of the human sphere books the back has got another book already we'll be unlocking more goals with funds from the pledge manager so that's infinity going uh, great guns and um the other cool thing that we did through the infinity kickstarter is unlock stretch goals for our other kickstarter projects so it's something that we wanted to do to say thanks to the other projects because it's all one big family really and um so for Acting Cthulhu, we unlocked a new adventure, actually adventure by Graham Davis, who's a uh, well-known name in the industry. He wrote a um, really cool new adventure called Under the Gun, which is set around Dover in World War II. For Mutant Chronicles, we've unlocked a plot generator for the GM, and um, you're going to be seeing more of that soon for uh, backers. So it's a very detailed uh, plot generator that takes you through uh, all the protagonists, the plots, how you get involved in the plot in the first place, um, side plots, locations, forces that might be involved, multiple locations, uh, twists in the tale, that kind of thing. It's loosely based on the big plot generator we've got for Acting Cthulhu, but it expands it for the Mutant Chronicles universe and gives it a lot of flavour. And then the other cool thing, for Thunderbirds, we unlocked another stretch card, which is called Brains' Notepad. And so what we're going to be doing is from January, we're going to be inv inviting fans to submit their cool variant ideas for Thunderbirds. So have you got an, a new idea for a rule? Have you got a new idea for a fab card, a scheme, uh, a disaster card, uh, or just some kind of or new way of playing maybe with eight players? So we're looking for it. We're going to be looking for everyone to submit all their ideas. Matt. Uh, is going to, to pick the ones that um, uh, uh, are the kind of strongest ideas because we can't put everything in and that we think have, have some kind of uh, quality to them. And he's going to be um, putting together this book with his notes as if he was brains. So, um, uh, you know, it'll be him going, oh, I think this is a really cool idea, but it's going to be really hard, you know. So he's going to be scribbling notes throughout the book that you'll see and uh, that will go out in PDF to all the backers. And the other thing that you're going to be see on screen here somewhere in a moment is the expansion plastics. And that is, we've just announced those. It's the sort of first uh, molded plastics of the pod vehicles and the, the disaster vehicles, which are, if you know Thunderbirds, it's a bit like Fire Flash, uh, the cool um, atomic powered airliner that has a bomb in its undercarriage. So um, uh, we've got some really great plastics that just come into the office actually, so we've got to approve those for production. And um, 
And that brings me actually to the other interesting bit of news, which is the Modifians community. And if you were at the Essen launch party, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's um, basically, we talked about this before we unlocked in the Cthulhu Kickstarter, a Modifians community that was going to be the ability for fans to submit cool ideas for creatures, for vehicles, for adventures, for stories, for NPCs, anything you want. And um, all the members who are essentially members of the Modifius who are customers or backers are going to be able to vote up or down the ideas, comment on them a bit like forum. This is kind of like a visual forum and um, uh, everyone will be able to submit ideas and then every three months we're going to skim off the top three or four and make those into a product. So they might be included in a new book, they might be included in uh, a monthly magazine we're going to be doing which is the um, based around the Forest of Fear comic book that we've been doing with our miniatures and uh, or they might find their way into uh, uh, another sort of free download product that kind of thing and um, now the other thing uh, is that we've said and a bit like I've mentioned we've got these stretch goals for Kickstarters is all our new Kickstarters will always have a stretch goal for all the current uh, Kickstarter projects that we have and the reason we're doing this is to show that Modifius isn't just creating another game, but we're expanding our family and we see this as one big family. And whether you you back just one of our projects or five of them, you should benefit from our success. We're going to be using the Modifians community to ask people what those rewards should be. So once it's established, and we hope it's going to be in the spring next year, we'll be putting out if, whenever the project we're going, right, what should the community goal be? And we want some of the goals to be stuff that rewards the whole community, that builds the community and, and gives everyone some value back. Some of them will be rewards that are specific to Acting Cthulhu or Mutant Chronicles. So um, it's very much about bringing everyone together, giving everyone a reason to support new projects. You don't have to support each new Kickstarter. Uh, the people who are getting the Thunderbirds uh, uh, stretch goal as a result of Infinity, they didn't have to back Infinity. So it's very much a thank you to the community and we'll be talking more about that soon. Board games, card games, and RPGs. Now's the time we ask, what's on your table? So, Zarina, uh, tell us what you've got, what you've been playing, what you've got for what's on your table. Are you ready for that? Oh, oh okay. On my table, it's a game that I played earlier this year, and I revisited it just because it's just so much fun. Um, and it's called Boss Monster, and I think a lot of you know about it. It's quite famous. It's a cute little two to four player card game in the style of old platform games like uh, emulating that 8 16 bit artwork it's really awesome i've actually played this game and now that i now that yeah, I think it's about really it. cool, isn't it? <laughs> so on one side you have well you've got all the players and the players are all the bad guys right yeah, well, the players are heroes, but you're the bad guy, but you're kind of, you have to win, so you get to play as the evil dude, which is, you know, it's really refreshing, actually. And um, you have to set up a dungeon that's going to kill the other people's heroes, and then your heroes have to try to survive the other people's dungeon, something like that? You can send heroes to try and mess up your, you know, the other players' rooms and dungeons, but the point is just to kill the heroes, because you steal their souls, and you count up the souls, and the first person to ten... Um, wins the game and you have to uh, try to make it through and not have five um, damage to you. You only get five kind of lives and if a hero gets through your rooms without dying then um, that counts as a hit against you. Okay, so they could call it Soul Reaver but that would be like a lot less fun title than... <laughs> uh, well, the game can trip you up because um, when uh, you get confused with uh, like how many uh, how much damage each room can do to you and you kind of because you can only I think five yeah like five cards in your hand you have to um, really really think about which one you're gonna like get rid of discard and which ones you can use and because some of them have uh, second level dungeons that you can't um, you can't build unless you have like certain requirement before that like it, it really like tests how much you plan in advance and um, whether you're going to play for yourself or whether you're going to um, knock, knock your opponents. 
And it's a really, really bitchy game, actually. Or it just depends how you play it. But I play it really, really bitchily, and you get really, really angry. And um, a friend uh, recently like took all my spells and I was saving them I was hoarding them because I didn't want people to see how strong I was and I was gonna totally win and they had this card that was like okay like completely like reverse everybody you know everyone's spells or steal the spell and it, I just got completely like messed up oh, so you can really interfere with the other players and what are the different rooms like oh no <laughs> so immature my god what are some of the rooms like I know there's different rooms in the game I've only played it a couple times um, you've got like uh, succubus rooms, basically you have uh, monster rooms and trap rooms and um, trap rooms, like your, your heroes fall into it um, and they're actually more uh, damaging than the monster rooms I think. But I haven't actually like, because there are so many cards, I don't think I've played with all of the room cards that are available in the game. And can you buy um, more, or is it pretty much the one box and that's got the game? It sounds like it's got a lot of uh, play value, though. There's an expansion, which I haven't played with yet, um, and it gives um, another dynamic, which is item cards that your heroes get to have, and it buffs the hero up, so they become harder to defeat. But if you defeat the hero, um, you get the reward on that item card that the hero has. Yeah, I do remember a number of games where somebody seemed like they were really ahead and then yeah, all of a yeah. sudden they weren't because it was like there was a card, I think, that made you trade hands with other people <laughs> and this kind of thing. So I think people who don't like a lot of luck in their games, I mean, obviously they should probably go for something more serious, I suppose. But this was like, a, I remember we used to play that in breaks at the beach uh, in between role-playing games. If people are like, ah, oh, I don't really have the energy to do a whole bunch of role-playing right now. But uh, they were always willing to play a hand of that. Yeah. Well, it's about planning. Like, there's luck and there's planning. But a, a lot of the time, like, I I had a really, really bad, bad hand, but I couldn't really build anything. So I had to keep picking up cards. So um, I opted not to build rooms, and then I kind of lost early because I, I didn't have anything to kill heroes with. But I, yeah. And then another time it was the same story, but I managed to almost win. Even though I had a really rubbish. So are you hand. good at this game? Would you say? I'm. I'm okay. I wouldn't say I'm. I'm. I'm good. I think I get too emotional. <laughs> Maybe it's the kind of game where it doesn't. Yeah, really, really, really brings out the, the anger in me, <laughs> even though it's like a really simple kind of childish I think, looking like, game. Because with me, games like that, I'm just like I don't care if I win, etc., etc., etc. I just sort of play them for fun. But it's kind of funny when you're playing a game that's not that serious, but you still get annoyed when you lose. Yeah, I think it's the the less um, serious it is, the more serious I get about it because it um, it brings out the child in me, and you know, I always want to win, and I don't like losing. <laughs> the child in you is very competitive, then. Yeah, very. Okay. Um, all right. Well, the game that I've been playing, uh, and I've actually got a copy of it here, is uh, I think this has got to be probably the biggest single adventure ever made, which is Horror on the Orient Express which Chaosium kickstarted last year, and they, they, they arrived in January. It's like seven books. It's over a 1,000 pages. I got it, and I'm kind of a lazy GM, so I was a little yeah. bit worried as to whether I'd actually like get through all of this stuff. I was like, I was like God, you know, there's actually like only a 10% chance I'm going to read all of the books in here. Um, but actually, I found that the story is so good. It's like a mystery. And it's a mystery that spans from London across Europe all the way to Constantinople and back like in 1923. And um, they, uh, I tell you, the set that you get with this is amazing. They have, uh, they've got, what, okay, we've got like a bumper sticker, and they actually have passports for the players that they can fill out. Although, quite frankly, since these are my only ones, I don't know if I want them to write on them, but I guess it would be okay. Um, it's, but if, if you're sort of like a collector geek, you might be like, I don't want to ruin these things. Postcards in there, all kinds of things. There are... Uh, there's a knife that you, that, you, that you get at a certain point in the game. And there are bits of... The, what the players have to do is collect bits of this statue, which actually, they give you the statue and it sort of fits together. And the more that you collect the statue, like, the more strange things begin happening. Um, so, but the thing is, is that it's so well written that, um, you know, really, I, like, last night, I remember I read, I read one of the books, which is the overall sort of campaign book, which gives you hints on kind of like a view, a bird's eye view of the campaign and hints on how to run it well. 
And uh, I'd say if you're worried about getting the game because you don't know if you'll have the time, once you read the first couple chapters of the first book, the first adventures in the first book, it's going to hook you and you're going to want to read about all the other stuff. And, it, and somehow it makes it, sometimes as, it, as like an adult game master, I find it hard after a long day's work to read a game book and actually kind of like have it sink in. But the story is so good, um, that, you know, because of the way it hooks you, that when you read something new about it, it kind of like naturally goes into your mind like where it would in a story. If you read a novel that's, a, you know, 800 pages long, you're not going to forget what happened in the novel because it's a story that's well told. So this is a great example of like super uh, role-playing adventure writing where it's just like that. So you read something new and I just find it's very easy to remember all of it. So that's really cool. And... What's more, they have figures, which I bought, which, is, which are really cool. RAFM has these, and uh, it's 10 figures, and these are some of, the, some of the characters that you'll meet during the game. So you can see there's some, like, cultist guys in fezes, there's a prince, there's a person, a couple people without any skin, which is, we haven't really gotten to that point in the adventure yet. Um, yeah, anyway, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different sort of, like, uh, props that come with the game and actually what I started doing as soon as I saw the props that came with the game I got so interested in the idea of just setting up my tape my dining room table to look like the Orient Express and to try to bring the experience to the players as much as I could I went on eBay and I just started like buying anything that was cheap that was from the Orient Express that I find so I've got like a couple coasters from the bar on the Orient Express which are little paper coasters which I put inside some plastic coasters to protect them um, I found a tray for about like 10 bucks that had like a picture of the train on it and, you know, nice tablecloth on the table and mood lights and any of the old antiques we have around the house. We just stick them in the room like a globe and a, you know, sort of detectives. Uh, what do you call those things? Magnifying glass? Oh, oh, you know, I used to think called magnoscopes. Don't laugh. I thought they were called magnoscopes. They're called magnifying glasses. I'm pretty I sure that's like, what they're called. <laughs> I feel like a magnoscope must be big. And scientific. <laughs> you know, you have a telescope, which is big, so I thought that the tiny one is a magnoscope. But, you know. That's... It makes perfect sense. <laughs> I'll have one of those. And then, you know, we find, since we have, everybody's over 21, so we have period drinks as well. Um, which you oh, have yeah, to sort of, what? but it's a 19 adventure game, and you have to really pace yourself. I think when we were, when we were on port, it was, it was perfectly fine. When we switched last time to bourbon, it wasn't very oh, good. God, <laughs> The players got very little done. So I would say that alcohol-wise, if we can make drink recommendations for, for games, which we probably should start doing, I would say Port is very good. <laughs> Lacaro was good. Uh, Aperol, you know, any of your sort of really bitter European cocktails, I think would be, uh, would, would be great. Surely, surely gin, like some nice gin, like a tall like drinks be nice. Yeah, I want to know more about gin because I've heard that it was sort of like originally a miner's drink, but I think that it was starting to get cool by then. Um, certainly a period it, drink you could choose is the French 75, um, which is, which was actually named after a French artillery piece in World War I. Um, and it's, uh, it's two ounces of gin topped with champagne in a Collins glass. So if you can imagine the dimensions of a Collins glass with two ounces of gin in the bottom and the rest of it champagne, I mean, that's going to, that's going to pack a punch. Maybe yeah, only one yeah. of those. I mean, do you see that Vulcan eyebrow right now? I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but we had so much fun. I only had like three players playing it, but... It's just the world is so lush that they can that, that very quickly everybody just got really into their characters. There's an entire book of NPCs that has like really cool NPCs in there, which you're probably going to yeah. need uh, because the adventure is really dangerous and everybody's likely to die or go insane before the end of it. Um, but they just like, you know, if anybody said, well, who's who, who else is sitting at our table at this lecture? And like, oh, just a minute. Let me see. Pull out the book. Uh, and OK, you're sitting next to an eight year old peer of the realm. And the other, on the other side is a brigadier general. And then there's like this Italian woman who seems a bit mysterious. And everybody has backstories and stuff like that. So you're really entering into kind of this very literary and very well-researched world when you play the game. Um, so that's what we're playing. We're in session two. I would suggest if anybody wants to play it, actually to go online. And um, on YouTube, there are a couple of sessions of people who have played the game. Because there's so much going on that if you're going to be the, the game master for it, you probably want some idea of how to present it to the players and how to move from one part of the adventure to the next. So hearing somebody else going through it is really helpful. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds very um, populated and has a good pace to it. 
You know how sometimes you play like a role playing game online, video game, and you just feel like you're all alone in the world? It, it's the opposite of that. So going over to our Modifius headquarters in London, uh, Chris, what's on your table? So we're back to a classic, which is Defenders of the Realm. If you know us, we like our co-op games. I particularly like them. And Defenders of the Realm has been a regular on our gaming group's table over the last couple of years. And um, at Essen, I was uh, lucky to meet uh, Rick Schrand uh, from the publisher. And um, uh, he uh, swapped some uh, amazing expansions for Defenders of the Realm for uh, for Thunderbirds and uh, some Acton Cthulhu books. And um, so we've been able to get our hands on the, min the new Minions expansions. Well, they've been out for a while. And, and there's a couple of different hero sets and a new pack of quest cards. So basically, um, the Minion sets are pre-painted um, Minions. Uh, there's four armies in Defense of the Realm. So you can basically swap out one of those armies with one of the sets of Minions. And they're not just some figures get actually some elite versions of the figures as well. So the normal figures act as usual, uh, but you then have um, some smaller elite figures that have a bit more power. So for example, uh, one set when you attack them and you roll a one, they might do some damage to you. So it definitely um, makes the game more interesting and increases some of the difficulty. The elite minions are placed down whenever a third minion is placed in a location. So that mixes it up. You've got a lot of new choices in heroes. Uh, we had at least nine new heroes over two packs to play with. Uh, some really interesting characters. We actually uh, did away with the base game in, uh, sorry, base game heroes and just played with the new packs. And there's some very interesting characters. There's one who can change shape. He's a shapeshifter that can become a bear or a wolf and um, has various abilities. And other characters, the assassin, who can uh, move in, uh, unseen and kills immediately the first character in the space when she starts a combat, and um, but then appears obviously and she doesn't have to roll the dice. Um, another character, I can't remember the name actually. He's basically a, a sort of shaman who can uh, who has this sort of uh, um, fiery um, uh, a sort of wall of fire that descends upon a space and kills all creatures in the space except generals uh, without a dice roll however you must roll a dice and if you get a odd number you have tainted the land so it's very powerful but very risky so we had a great time playing with those and then the really cool thing was they've replaced the expense uh, the quest deck so the quest deck was quite a small deck with some very small quests in in the original game uh, you would every player has one and you travel around the map if you can um, get to this location and usually roll a few dice, you get a small kind of um, reward that you can use to de uh, defeat the creatures in the game. What they've done is expanded on this and actually made them, um, in some cases, two or three stages, uh, some more powerful, some more useful, and just made them a lot more thematic. And uh, they were really, really good to play with. And um, we had a great time. And of course, we lost. <laughs> so, um, so, um, but that's part of the we, we went with that. Uh, Three new sets of minions, so we really we went went to town, and um, oh, and, and also there's um, there was three new generals as well who were badass, and uh, we went up against one who um, who's the the red general, who's the sort of demon general, and he uh, immediately strips every player fighting him of random red card and of course he took all our best red cards if you know the game um you get one or two dice on each card and you're trying to assemble as many dice to combat him and it uh, just took all our our big hitting dice cards away and that was it so we lost so but really great expansions and I had a lot of fun defense of the realm is um it's one of those games it's super easy to teach and it you know it's all about these four armies descending on your capital city and you've got to run around and stop all the minions of these armies from gradually taking over and tainting the land and spreading like wildfire. And it's this kind of firefighting exercise uh, as well as a sort of battle and, and of course, lots of adventure. So uh, it's a great, great um, game. That's, uh, that's what's on our tables. And uh, try not to get as emotional as I get <laughs> when you play simple childish games. <laughs> And if, uh, if people want to put in the comments some of the games that they're playing, um, we will uh, we'll take a look at them. And what's on your table is not always new games either. I mean, sometimes it's games that have been out for a really long time that we want to resurface as sort of whatever you happen to be playing. So 
Um, I think we have two games that are highly recommended at complete, at complete opposite ends of the complexity and, and seriousness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Zarina, um, you had a couple. You had an interesting experience uh, recently. It's uh, you got into um, a new game that is coming out from Modifius, uh, and you've also uh, game mastered for the first time, I believe. So tell us what the game is and all about that. Okay, the game is Dust Adventures, uh, the RPG um, set in the Dust universe, created by Paolo Parente. So. I've played, you know, role-playing games, I've played like Dungeons and Dragons, obviously, all the Modiphius stuff, Infinity, Conan, Meteor Chronicles. And, uh, but the thing is, I've never GM before, and obviously, the Dust Adventures book only came out to us, like, about a week ago, so I had, like, two days to have a look at it before I was sent to this really wonderful event called Dust Off. It was the Dust European Championships, just outside of Birmingham, in the UK. So, there I am, I'm driving there, and then I pull up, and, um, you know, try to, you know, go through the book as fast as I could. And, you know, the one thing about it is that um, it's a really, really good, interesting, like, book as a game book to get into. Um, I feel that for a newbie, you know, GM or, you know, person new to role-playing, as a lot of the Dust players might be, um, that's what I found at the event anyway, um, it was really, really um, very user-friendly. It was really cool, actually. Um, the character generation, the way it's uh, laid out, the introduction, the universe uh, detail that it gives you was um, it's pretty brilliant. It's got gorgeous artwork, um, you know, amazing scenario at the end, which is really interesting. Um, it's the prequel to Operation Apocalypse. It's a game that's going to come out. And um, so I'm reading through the little scenario, and so I've got these um, two uh, Americans dropped into... France on this covert mission, so I'm like, oh my god, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, let's like make this fun, and so um, we only did about half an hour of time permitting. And well, so wait, first things first, so did you, did, you, did you also manage to talk to Paolo Parente about the game? I did, I met him, and I had a little chat with him, I have an interview, so we're going to listen to that soon, um, and he's a really nice guy, he's really awesome, he gave a little um, introduction to the universe, so it was really nice to... to the creator there, you know, the creator himself, and lots of news and announcement at the event. Really exciting stuff. All right, let's take a listen to that because it might sort of set up uh, the world a little bit for uh, for what we'll talk about next. So this is Zarina here from Modiphius and we have Paolo Parente himself. Hello. We are at the Dust Off in Telford, the European Championships for Dust. And uh, we're talking about the RPG. So um, when did the idea for an RPG happen? And how, how did it start seeding? The idea has been there for a long time. And uh, what was cool is that um, Chris, from Modifius approached me exactly the same time I wanted to approach him to do the to the role playing for Dust really? because I <laughs> loved Actum Cthulhu. Yeah. And I said, I, as soon as I saw Actum Cthulhu, I thought oh, this is the perfect company we can we could do with the the RPG for Dust. And then he, exactly in the same time, he contacted me. By emails and oh, you know, of course, of course, of course, I would be honored to work with your if yes. So it was just magic. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> just very lucky. That's amazing. Um, what do you feel the Dust Adventures um, RPG will offer to the current players of Dust? Well, of course, there is more depth in the background mm -hmm. description, and and this is a very good tool to provide the players. A, better written and more complete background for Dust. Also, Dust 
as, as, as a complex universe and we will, will introduce new type of adventures, more mystery, it's really a good... Like a compliment. Compliment, yeah. thank you, for the whole universe, the whole line, yeah. Yeah, so much more like colour and texture and background to, okay. to everyone. Your English is very good. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Yay! He said my English is good! <laughs> um, so, do you have a favourite hero or, um, you know, like a created character? Sigrid von Thaler, yeah. Yeah? The nasty lady. Yeah. The nasty lady. <laughs> I'm, Why? I, I, I don't know. All my life I've been always very attracted to nasty ladies. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> He's attracted to nasty ladies. <laughs> She's beautiful and so nasty. <laughs> what can I do? I'm <laughs> just turning yes. into a guinea pig at the moment. <laughs> and um, finally, um, what side are you rooting for? What side are you on? <laughs> what, what side are you? Yeah, what side are you taking? <laughs> Oh, I'm with Sigrid all the way. Yeah. yeah so the axes, yeah. Yeah, okay. It goes with the whole nasty, nasty yeah, thing, yeah. I like the nasty <laughs> in general. Yeah. Well, thank and, you. And our axes are nastier than the actual historical Nazis, so. Yeah, these are worse, sense. they're much worse. So, you hear that? He's a uh, nasty, nasty. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Paolo. Hey, thank you. Okay, so you, where did you run the demo and who were the players and uh, set the scene for us a little bit for your first uh, game mastering experience? Okay, um, the demo was at uh, Ingenuity. It's a really interesting place. It's a locomotive and engine museum. In, um, it's part of this iron, it's called the Iron Bridge Collection and it's in a place uh, in England where there was a lot of industry, lots of, um, lots of factories and engines being built during the Industrial Revolution. And um, there's this giant, giant cavernous hall with like raw iron works and very atmospheric cosplay. And um, so I'm sitting down with um, my friend who was helping me out with the demo and he's also a role player. And then another, you know, quite luckily for me, experienced role player who was a um, competitor in the dust off championships. So, you know, you've got someone who's, you know, really, really knows a lot about the dust and you've got my friend who doesn't know anything and then me who's kind of in between <laughs> so but between us we had enough experience to you know make this a fun 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 ride and were you in costume all of you were in costume i i wasn't because sadly um i don't have a you know 1947 esque at the moment so i'm gonna get that together soon that's a, but, quick, uh, a quick trip down to the shops or ebay for that oh yeah yeah you know just go to like somewhere. <laughs> I've got, I've got Vintage. that. Halloween's coming up. I've got a Cossacks outfit that I'm going to be wearing again. So no, but for me, like I think I would definitely be um, sort of the uh, U USS, you know, um, be the, the Russian Sino uh, pilot because uh, you know I'm from Kazakhstan. So to me, there's that romantic draw to um, to kind of emulate where I come from. Yeah, definitely there were players. So tell us about. So were you nervous before starting? Oh my god, I was I was so nervous because um, you know, as with anything new, you think, oh my god, everyone's going to best you, they're going to grill you. Um, but it, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, I was grilled about info, but you know, I, I held up my end pretty well, and so I was just like, okay, screw it, I'm just going to dive into this and be, you know, crazy and like mysterious. So, what was was there a moment when you were like, okay, I got this? Because I know that that happens with me sometimes when I'm like. You're worried. You're pushing, and all of a sudden, you're like, "Okay, this is this is gonna work." I think what I had was, I got this. I think, yeah, no, wait, okay, it doesn't matter. They don't know. I'm just gonna wing this. That's the other thing. Nobody can see inside your head, so nobody really yeah. knows whether whether it's. A, <laughs> yeah. And you can play with them. You know, if if give them a red herring if you need time to think. You know. Or tell everybody to go to go get a soda while you read the next chapter. Always is helpful. Yeah, and it was only like um, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, and um, we, I managed to. Well, they did it to themselves. It wasn't my fault. So we had, um, you know, they abandoned 
someone that they should have rescued. So, you know, I kind of felt like, no, you kind of need to be punished for that. And uh, we had uh, severe injuries that uh, was not fixed. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was really funny. Um, and then uh, it's what, what, it, what it's done for me, though, is it's made me really curious about GMing properly, though. So that was a really good experience for me. The secret is, I think that probably is proper GMing. Um, so just tell us really quickly, like what the scenario was about and where, um, you, and where you got it from. Is it in the book or where did you get it? It's in the book, um, but I don't want to give away too much because um, it's, it's just really nice to, to read it yourself. Um, you can have a look, it's on page 180. Um, it's called Operation Apocalypse. And basically um, you have a crew, or, you know, whoever's playing and you have to rescue somebody, a character, uh, from the clutches of like the Germans in France, so you're being airdropped, and so from there, you know, there's a lot of. I mean, I don't, I don't want to reveal because obviously I've read it through, and um, yeah, that's, I'm not going to say any more than that because it's, it's really interesting. And yeah, like, to find out more, you have to read the book. Um, and so, <laughs> one of the most difficult things, particularly when you're GMing for the first time, is getting your head around the mechanics and how how you resolve things that the players want to do. Can you tell us briefly about how that worked in that game? Like, how did you resolve a simple, you know, the, a player wants to do something? How do you resolve that? Um, well, it's their stats. So whatever um, their character has, or if they've like rolled, or it's a pre-gen, um, whatever is their ability in in that core skill against the difficulty of the actual task. Did you spend a lot of time sort of tangling with the rules, or was it pretty um, straightforward? It's, it's all written in there. It's, it's quite easy to find, but just um, kind of finding the correct one to look at because it's spread across certain pages um, because it's not... Uh, so you've got action in one place and then you've got like um, skill checks in another, so they're not together, um, but that's just the, because of the narrative of the book. That's just the way it's like written out. But it didn't, no, it didn't take long at all, mainly because we didn't have the time to kind of faff around, so... It was, it was good that it didn't take long anyway to find what you needed to do. So do you have any advice for anybody who might be playing the game, running the game for the first time? <laughs> Devour the book. It won't take long. It really is like a, and then it's like a, a day's read or like two days read. Yeah, it's not, it wouldn't take too long at all, um, especially for an experienced person. But yeah, just, just get to grips with the, with the book and um, you know, think about what the characters can do, like what, what could they potentially do, and that would prepare you for how things can play out. Oh, Josh, look, I've got, um, I wanted to share, I don't know if this is coming up very well, can you see it? I can totally see that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so where did you get that? It is a guide on how to speak Klingon and I got this at last year's Destination Star Trek and uh, I think it's like my favorite little um, little book so far it's got a uh, it's got buttons that you can press and you can hear how to speak Klingon <laughs> can you try that can you show us okay 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 I got um, your mother has a smooth forehead and that's uh <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Do they have talking books now? Is that what's going on? I've never seen something like this. It's like the children, you know how, um, oh, you know, counting sheep, counting um, whatever, cows. So you've got this one, which is um, in the office, at a sporting event. Uh, you got at karaoke night, on the public transportation. So... <laughs> So I've got karaoke night. You've got today is a good day to die, and that's. <laughs> wow, that is cool. That's like a really good Christmas present for somebody, and Christmas is coming up. Yeah, it's a really good one. So who makes that? This is um, made by uh, CBS Studio. So it's um, sorry. It's made um, by Chronicle Books, and it's, um, I think it's like a commission by CBS Studios, so like, her own Star Trek. Wow. Okay. Well, that's very high production values. That's really cool. I'm crazy.
Did it uh, did it help you learn? Can you did it teach you any Klingon phrases that you can now rattle off? Sorry. Did it actually teach you how to speak the phrases that are in the book? Have you memorized them? Uh, yeah, in the first uh, page, it's got Klingon pronunciation. Oh, okay. Well, give us one. Can you say anything? Okay. So you got like the uh, the favorite <laughs> sound. Can you do that again? Which is a G A. <laughs> okay. That's an important sound. Uh, it says it's the gog. Oh, no, yeah, it's a goggly French R. So it's the <laughs> sound. <laughs> and then there's the T L H, the trickiest sound. It says to say it like a torpedo, but instead of going through with the T, you drop the sides of your tongue to let the air noisily hiss out. So. Yes. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> so you don't actually pronounce T L S. No. Uh. Yeah. yeah. That one takes a lot. Of, it is like French then. Yeah. So if you go to a Klingon like, restaurant, you speak to them in Klingon, and they'd respond to you in English probably. Yeah, maybe it's, it's like angry French. I mean, I I liken it to my uh, actual language back home, which is Kazakh. We have a lot of <laughs> and <laughs> kind of sounds. So if you're Kazakh, you actually have like a, a bonus to to learn this language. Yeah, I swear, like, it's, uh, it's based on my culture anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's not news to me. If you are a Kazakh and you're watching, we appreciate your comments in the comments section. Which I really would. I'd like, I'd like some feedback on that. Well, the whole Borat thing, I know the government was upset about that, so I hope you don't start an international incident. Crunch. Actually, I need to make a... Ah, shut up. Uh, Oh, go away. I need to make a Kazakh Klingon charter, actually, like a group. So if anyone's out there who wants to do that with me, you get in touch. Is, is somebody mixing drinks? It sounds like somebody's making martinis in there. I, I wish. It's just food. Because I'm, I'm in an apartment um, with friends. Uh, is that eggs? It sounds like cooking eggs. It's, it's, it's pasta. Uh, spaghetti bolognese, I think. It's a very non-Klingon dish, so unfortunately, no, no live um, worms or anything. No gah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah where's the gah? <laughs> so tell us about Comic Con. What, what's going on? Any cool new things? What, what's happening there? Um, you know, I, I actually haven't um, been. I've been hiding out here in the apartment because. In recent years, this Comic Con has gone so crazy and expanded, and so many people about. So I'm going to go in tomorrow. Um, some of my friends have, you know, they kind of die hard Comic Con goers, so they've been in all day, you know, in there. Yeah, and and they're in tomorrow, and they were in on Friday, so um, they're crazy. <laughs> but um, we're going to go in tomorrow and just chill. And the main thing for a lot of people is that it's a social event, so. Um, we have a massive gathering of most of our friends going here. So it's like a massive pilgrimage. We get to see everyone. Lots of parties going on. It's a really good vibe. Well, that's cool. And so are there? So it's it's mostly the social things. Are there any exhibits or anything you're particularly looking forward to attending? Um, I'm looking forward to uh, about these events. I'm more excited about the cosplay because um, the cosplay game here is amazing, and I love uh, seeing like all the effort and amazing costumes that people have made. So for me, um, I kind of get more excited about um, events abroad rather than events here because it's just so so mad. I can't like get get to the front and see it anyway. It's just so mad. It's a huge, huge, huge venue, like aircraft hangar size. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's quite an experience. So like if you, if you can get here, if anybody can get here and experience it once, it's, it's got to be experienced. And um, it's a really good, really good fun. But you've got to pace yourself because it's not for the faint hearted. Okay, that brings us to the end of this episode, and uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you for joining us, and send us a message or put something in the comments. Um, if you want to see us cover a particular topic, if you have questions about any of the games that we discussed, um, let us know. Um, so from the San Francisco area, uh, this is me, Josh, signing off. 
And goodbye from London, and next time we'll be in the new Modifius headquarters as we're moving offices next week, out of our little home. So finally we get our house back and um, we'll have a wonderful office for everyone to work in. See you. <laughs> and from London, this is Zarina saying goodbye, you've been amazing. And again, if there are any clear ones out there who are Kazakh and would like to dispute this or, you know, let's make a thing, um, let's do this. Uh, I want to leave you with this, this, uh, this saying, it's called Hold Me Closer, Tiny Dancer <laughs> in Klingon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>